I've been contemplating the saying in Blake's short, little, early book, There Is No Natural Religion, because I think it contains a summary of his vision and vocation. Maybe you could even say that everything else that follows in his life and creativity is an increasingly extended and expansive reflection upon what he pinpoints and sees so clearly in this early book. And in particular this phrase, if the many become the same as the few when possessed, more more is the cry of a mistaken soul, less than all cannot satisfy man. I think it's a powerful analysis of the modern predicament, the way that we've mistaken the possession of a few things, accumulating them as much as we can into the more more, the many things, mistaking that for the all, because we want the all. And it's a powerful analysis not just another cry about possessiveness. Because what Blake realises is that there's no point in saying to people, want less, desire less, give things up, limit or constrain your embrace of life. Even moderate your desire. Because we're driven in our souls by the desire for all. And that is a true part of what it is to be human. So, rather... What he understood so early on is that the need is to direct our desire towards that which, that which can truly satisfy this sense of knowing, embracing, sharing in all things. That is what he launched himself into. I think the key is that when we don't participate in life in this way, we then lose the sense of contact with life, become frustrated with the sense that somehow we're being constrained and so therefore switch to the possessive attitude that cries more, more, that tries to hold on to a few things as if that were all things. Now, in a still relatively early book that Blake uses to forge his vision and turn it really into his own voice, I think. We get some powerful intimations of how this switch from more and more to the all might come about. It's the well-known short book, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. And it begins with the argument, which is to address what you might call our fallen state. And it's a world that has become confused a world in which the just walk in the veil of death, not on the mountains of life, in which roses are mixed with thorns, in which the very air feels burdensome, the clouds seem hungry, bees buzz on barren heaths. Blake's prophetic vision suggests in an increasingly frighteningly literal manifestation now, and the predicament that he analyzes, the fall he perceives, is that we human beings have forgotten that deities, spirits, vitalities, the fullness of life, reside in the human breast and so can be directly known. They don't have to be sought out, possessed, held onto as if they're scarce. All the things that make for the all, life itself, can be directly known within us. Blake says in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, in one of the well-known proverbs of hell, truth can never be told so as to be understood and not believed. Truth, when we understand it, is also to believe it, because we're not being persuaded as if from the outside in, like a proof, we're knowing it as a realisation from within. And so truth and understanding and belief in the sense of trust come together. You might say that we have forgotten that everything that lives is holy 
he says in another proverb. And this is our calling to see the divine vision in all and know we know the all because God is all in all, as St Paul put it. And with that, we might have a chance of moving on from the way of life that seeks merely more and more things, objects, experiences, as a kind of cover for emptiness, fear and desperation, because of awakening to the divine that is all in all, including in us as we participate and share in that life. So the sayings from the marriage of heaven and hell are like provocations, often complex, confusing provocations, excessive provocations, but they are designed, I think, to propel us with the energy itself that is the transformation. He's not advocating a corrective, you might say, a way of responding, which is already itself a sign of being in the cavern of this confusion. That would be an attempt to correct or control or cajole our desire. Rather, he's seeking this transformation of perception that doesn't seek to lessen anything, but open onto a path of liberty, awakening, vision. It's not rational. And it even embraces our mistakes, because by discerning our mistakes, rather than trying to push away our mistakes, we can perceive the infinite in all things. It's the radical nature of his gospel, hence the notion that heaven and hell can be married. And that marriage of heaven and hell arises because part of the state of possessiveness we find ourselves in, a deeper analysis of that state, is a confusion of good and evil itself, of heaven and hell themselves. We're inclined to call reason, constraint, rule, the only goods, and so energy, activity, delight, as evils. And you see this particularly, Blake realises, in the advocacy of moral imperatives or limiting our desires or controlling our attention, as if that could be some kind of solution. It can't be because they backfire, because they secretly, subtly, implicitly keep in play the worldview that says we must constrain ourselves, we must govern ourselves. And that plays into the idea that more and more is really better, rather than this step into the all, which we always already have, if only we can see it. The truth of that false approach is exposed in some of the proverbs of hell, um, releasing the energy that they constrain by exposing them. So, for example, he says, prisons are built with stones of law, brothels with bricks of religion. It's a explicitly, deliberately provocative comment that law actually makes prisons, when, of course, we're told that laws are supposed to make us free and that religions actually build brothels because they constrain desire particularly in Christianity, don't know what to do with erotic desire. He says in another well-known phrase, the tigers of wrath are wiser than the horses of instruction. We must go towards the tiger that, of course, in his famous poem, The Tiger, he knows can be frightening, is wrathful, but there's something in that energy which is wiser than the laborious effort to control ourselves by instructing ourselves. We've closed ourselves up and see all things through narrow chinks as a cavern, he says in another proverb. The system contains, the fountain overflows, and we live in a fountain, not a system, as we're often told. Expect poison from standing water. If the vision is untransformed, the water stands still like it does in a cistern. And our efforts to progress from within the finite limit our perceptions of life because we've forgotten that we live in a cosmos like a fountain overflowing. And in another part of the short book, Blake explains how this closing up from life causes stink and decay. It's the life that 
limits itself to analysis, systematic reason, not participating in that which flies, which diverts, which flames. So the book often contains not just visionary encounters with prophets and angels, but apocalyptic, memorable fancies, seeking to stir up that which has been called evil and confused with that which is called good. Um, it's a bit like the realisation that he captures in another part of There is No Natural Religion. The bounded is loathed by its possessor. If we bind ourselves in life thinking we need to live bounded lives, we end up loathing that way of life, even as we say we must possess that life. And it leads to consumption because, as Blake puts it, the devourer, the consumptive way of life, the devourer only takes portions of existence and fancies that the whole. It's another way of putting why more and more destroys and only the all releases because we force portions of existence to be the whole of existence in our possession of the few. So he links this to the famous conjuries of Blake, which are unpacked in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell as well, the finite, infinite, the static and dynamic, reason and vision, hate and love. And in a way, this is to provoke an awakening beyond the contraries. Um, this is not an integration of opposites or polarities, as sometimes Blake is interpreted as. Rather, it's by putting the contraries together to awaken us to that which be, it is beyond the contraries. It's kind of beyond good and evil. So from living in a false world created by the empirical or the philosophical, um, back to participation via the poetic and the prophetic, um, the empirical and philosophical, when it becomes sovereign in Blake's mind, leads to trying to juggle things, um, whereas the poetic and the prophetic is that capacity to embrace the transcendent energy that the contra is set up. And the test of this expansion, the test of the poetic and the prophetic, is that it releases us into the infinite. Um, Isaiah talks to Blake in The Marriage of Heaven at Hell at one point and says that the test of prophecy and poetry is that it sees the infinite in all things. So when we feel the freedom, the expanse, the capacity to say yes to all things and not hold on to anything, that is the true test of knowing the infinite, is to see the inside of things and to put our energies not into trying to consume or accumulate, but into mingling with that which is round and about us. It's the infinite desire that won't be constrained, not because it's being told, but because it knows that the all is around us and can be stepped into in a moment. And so this vision rebuilds the experience of being human and being in the world from the ground up, moment by moment, experience by experience, which is to say that it stresses the importance of now as a way of feeling into the energy of the moment, just as it is. Um, it's the complement of the withdrawal which is known in some mystical traditions, the shedding of creatureliness, to know the divine emptiness, as Meister Eichhardt puts it. Now Blake sees himself not as a mystic, but as a visionary. As it were, he knows how to move into the intimate depth which is in ourselves, where the divine presence is. But seeing that divine presence immediately as well in the activity of all creatures and things around us. It's sometimes said that the Vedantic is complemented by the Tantric um, and this is why sometimes Blake is called a Tantric master rather than teaching the apophatic way of the Vedantic emptiness which is just the preparation for the fullness the infinite that can flow into the emptiness, which can be a valuable preparation because we're so hooked on the consumptive. Now, what does this mean in more practical 
immediate experiential ways. It means, for example, that everything has a season because you're with the energies that are around and about as well as within them, part of them. So you go with the flow, Blake says. In seed time, learn. In harvest, teach. In winter, enjoy. Or in another proverb, he says, think in the morning, act in the noon, eat in the evening, sleep in the night. Going with the moment as it is, not trying to force it to be something else, which is what the possessive or mechanical way of life tries to do. And so he also re remarks that the hours of folly are measured by the clock, but of wisdom no clock can measure. And then this participative experience of what is happening and known now changes our sense of what it is to be a body amongst other bodies. The empirical instead becomes a kind of portal to the infinite, to the all. So he remarks, what is called the body is a portion of soul discerned by the five senses, the chief inlet of soul in this age. So in the possessive, confused age, a good first step is to see how the senses are an inlet of the soul, to start to see that the body is actually the presence of the all in depth. And so he can make other remarks like this. How do you know but that every bird that cuts the airy way is an immense world of delight closed by your senses five? This immense world of delight that the bird displays when it cuts the airy way is the body experienced as echoing cosmic experience. And this can be very particular too. So Blake remarks, the eyes of fire, the nostrils of air, the mouth of water, the beard of earth. The parts of our body can be known to echo with parts of life, fire, air, water, earth. And also the mind knows that its thoughts share in infinite life, even as they seem particular and limited. The felt quality of that particularity is actually expansive. One thought fills immensity. Blake remarks and note that because Blake's own thoughts have this expansive immense feeling even as we're following his particular line of demonstration one thought fills immensity. This is also rec to recognize that humanity is not fed by more more by the few the accumulation of things but directly by divine life. He says, the fox provides for himself, but God provides for the lion. And we're being recommended the life of the lion that roars its way into life, if you like, rather than the fox known for its cunning that tries to make life for itself. And so he says in another reference to the poor fox, the fox blames the trap, not himself. So we must address ourselves, not that which seems to trap us, because when we pay attention to our capacities, switch our attention from the objects of experience that we try to hold on to, to the quality of attending itself, then we feel the divine life opening up within us, known in the manifold things. It's using the imagination, in other words, and contemplating the world as we live in it. And this leads to the true discovery of the all. Um, Blake puts it like this, what is now proved was once only imagined. The imagination is the entry into life. And then, you know, some things are proved as reason and empirical life. The body serve that wider experience. Everything possible to believed Everything possible to be believed is an image of truth, Blake says in another way. So it's a kind of educative process too, um, one that comes with acting, with participating, being in life, rather than withdrawing from life and sort of studying through analysis. Um, because he's saying that it's direct knowledge that satisfies, that knows the all. 
So summary rules, for example, as if there's one rule that you must follow that will lead into a full life. They must be abandoned. One law for the ox, sorry, one law for the lion and ox is oppression, he says. And it's not also about just analysis. Aristotle comes in for quite a lot of criticism in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. Aristotle being aligned with the logical life, as opposed to Diogenes the Cynic, who's also referred and celebrated for living in a barrel naked before life, if you like. That's what we must try to learn and know. And a really tremendous and powerful revolution is revealing itself in this way. Because he's saying that the contemplative life is not the passive life that sometimes it's taken to be. Rather, it's the consumptive life that's passive. Because contemplation brings all that we are into all that is. Whereas consumption overlooks or even anaesthetizes all that we are. Consumptive life is one that's asleep because it's driven by others' desires or fabrications. Whereas contemplation awakes as it shares in the divine desire that is present in all things. This turn of attention from the objects of experience to the very qualities of life itself. And this is the sense, I think, of revolutionary phrases like the road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom. The excess here is plunging into life and the wisdom that builds into the palace of wisdom is that inward direct understanding knowing sharing in life itself life shows up as it really is infinite because the doors of perception have been cleansed and so blake can also say a fool sees not the same tree that a wise man sees wisdom sees eternity in all things which is expressed in another wonderful saying eternity is in love with the productions of time another way of putting it is that participation is marked by loving but loving that's not marked by possessiveness but by freedom and this can be known in quite mundane joys dip him in the river who loves water Blake says in another proverb or the pride of the peacock is the glory of God. To create a little flower is the labour of ages. The river, the peacock, the little flower reveal love, glory, the work of ages, depth. But of course these mundane joys are not really mundane at all when seen aright. Energy is eternal delight, always. Exuberance is beauty and of course beauty is of God participation comes with plunging oneself into life because then life unfolds before you it's about following the impulse of the moment as Jesus did Blake says in the marriage of heaven and hell the figure who didn't withdraw from life but lived it to the full including suffering and death but here this unfolding reveals that all is revealed from one moment to the next so he says excess of sorrow laughs, excess of joy, weeps. These things follow like seasons. But this takes courage, knowing the all is bracing, saying yes to life can be scary. Letting in what's present to you right now can feel hard, which though is why the fearful try to manage life with the cunning of the fox. The weak in courage is strong in cunning, Blake remarks. This plunging also means that we can learn from our mistakes. And in fact, this is what we must do now to understand how we've confused heaven and hell, good and evil. Um, Realise that we've mistaken the all for the restrictive, possessive desire for more and more. By, say, noticing how consumption doesn't satisfy, but rather alienates even as it destroys. You never know enough unless you know what is more than enough, Blake remarks. Or if the fool would persist in his folly, 
he would become wise. In some ways, this is applying this yes to life, even to the mistaken times now, because if we pay attention to our foolishness, we will become wise that way. We don't even have to turn our backs on life, but rather dive into the life we have now with more depth, and then it will transform. And again, another test of this is not just that the infinite is revealed rather than the accumulation of finite things, that love and freedom is revealed rather than fear and anxiety, but it's able to say yes even to death. The cut worm forgives the plough, Blake remarks, or drive your cart and your plough over the bones of the dead. Death is known as actually a release when properly perceived. A dead body revenges not injuries, Blake sees. And this is why there's always hope, even in times that seem desperate, because the infinite is always around us. And all we have to do is to turn to it. It doesn't go anywhere. The soul of sweet delight can never be defiled, he remarks. When thou seest an eagle, thou seest a portion of genius. Lift up thy head. The very act of changing and converting, struggling with this revolution is to participate in what the revolution promises. The man who never alters his opinion is like standing water, Blake says, and breeds reptiles of the mind. But changing your opinion, therefore, is like moving from the cistern of standing water to the fountain of life itself. So, the dynamic is an inner awakening coupled to the outer expression, seeing the inwardness in all things, not just in yourself. It comes with bringing out what is inner within us, and that very act awakens us to the inwardness that's in all things. It's an improvement of sensual enjoyment. Blake stresses, via an improvement of our interior or imaginative capacities to delight. He whose face gives no light shall never become a star, Blake says. But when our face lights up with our inward light, we see the stars lighting up around us and know ourselves as being part of the bright lights of the cosmos. So this adds further things to our humanity and our relation to the world, it gives us a vocation, not just a way of recovering divine vision, but actually then actively in being part of the world, because I think Blake thought that human nature is consciously to love the world, as opposed to less consciously or even unconsciously loving the world as other creatures do. So he says, the bird a nest, the spider a web, man, friendship. We don't just live in our home, but we know when we're at home because we feel the world and life is a friend to us. And it's a participation consciously, therefore, in divine life. For Blake the Christian, Blake the follower of Jesus, realised that we are divine in our humanity too. And so he says, God only acts and is in existing things, in existing beings or men. This is realising that at the heart of our humanity is the divinity that gave birth to our humanity. It's not incidentally a collapse of all that's divine into the merely human, because that would be to get caught up in the ratio of possessiveness that wouldn't lead to genuine novelty, but would rather struggle and fear that all there was was one small thing after another and would lose touch with the all from whence we're born. And so we add to the inner or infinite life of nature by our participation in it as human beings through our direct awareness and understanding of its dynamics, bringing that to consciousness itself is to amplify life, be that in poetry and the prophetic, but also in the empirical and the rational, when it's seen to be in the service of this all. Where man is not, nature is barren. 
Blake says in another provocative comment, by which he means that we can add to the fecundity of nature by being with nature in this conscious way. And it leads to virtues too, the virtues that open us up as opposed to the moral laws that constrain. He references virtues like kindness, forgiveness, the love that inspires life. The most sublime act is to set another before you, he says, because you know that other is also you, because you're all sharing in the all. Gratitude is another key indicator. The thankful receiver bears a plentiful harvest. That's to know yourself as sharing in this fountain of life. And forgiveness is in the mix too, because we can see our mistakes, learn from our mistakes, even those made by our seeming enemies. If others had not been foolish, we should be so, Blake says in a kind of variant of the thought that there, but for the grace of God go I. There's even a place for that which misled us in Blake's renewed vision the sovereign, empirical and rational that when it thinks it rules, destroys. Because Blake realises that measurement is not the norm. It only takes over to when the fear of scarcity rules. Um, bring out number, weight and measure in a year of dearth, he says. So this is saying that if you assess your world by number, you feel you live in a perpetual year of dearth. And so measurable growth becomes a false metric of life. But instead, when the empirical and rational serve the prophetic and the poetic, they can release what they measure and weigh into the all, and so help us discern the infinite in that which is before us. Blake incidentally implies that this philosophy is better known in the East, as he puts it. Perception is better understood in the traditions of the East as opposed to the empiricism of the West, which was emerging in his time and has more or less taken over ever since. It's his reading of the Bhagavad Gita, for example, that told him how awareness of the veiling of the infinite, the Maya, which isn't saying that all things are delusion in themselves, but that our understanding of all things can get confused by ignorance. The Gita helped, I think, awaken Blake to seeing the nature of all things as they truly are, which is another reason why Blake is sometimes called a tantric master. Though he also says that this poetic genius was known by the biblical prophets. And so in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, he describes conversing with Isaiah and with Ezekiel by being taken on a tremendous apocalyptic journey by the angel and by refusing the empire of the kings, the empire building of the kings as described in the Hebrew Bible and of course as known in the modern world too, as if possessing more and more can deliver satisfaction. So in summary, the key principles for discovering the all in life. Want it all. Don't try and constrain those wants by following the desire, the energy, the exuberance, not as the accumulation of experiences, as if the way to live life was to put a bucket list in front of you, which of course is really to be haunted by death, but rather as contempl contemplating what is happening right now not what is elsewhere, not what you hope might lie in the future, but all that is happening now. And this combination of loving life and expansive perception is what reveals the all in a freedom that is infinite. And it's also to bring in a continual process of education of this desire the capacity to follow this exuberance into all things. Because there's a need to discern the truly infinite from false and limited forms, which is not always straightforward to do, particularly in a consumptive age of advanced capitalism that is quite prepared to pretend that the infinite lies in the finite and to sell accumulation 
as if it can lead to this expansiveness. Instead, we must know that all reveals itself by participating in the life around us in a way that doesn't destroy the life around us by trying to cajole it to deliver something for us, instead realising that we share life with all that is. It is not about seeing one thing, then another, then another, the more more logic. Rather, it's about seeing the infinite. Seeing that the infinite is everything and holy. This final inflection, the sense of the sacred, can also be a guide in this expansive embrace of the all. It means that, at least in principle, a single river, a single feather, a single flower is enough to participate in the all of life, the divine life, because the river, the feather, the flower, in their quality of being, are known as holy, as sacred. And that, Blake, shows us in the energy of his lines, in the power of his provo provocation, in the revolution of his attention, is to understand and know and live in eternity.